Uh, joining us now is Professor Eric Foner. He is an author and also uh, an emeritus professor of history at Columbia. He's also a leading expert on Reconstruction and is the author of uh, a book titled Reconstruction. Uh, professor Foner, thank you for joining us. Yeah, nice, nice to be here to talk to you. And I'll just say, Professor Foner, you know, I'm a high school history teacher. We're about to teach uh, Reconstruction soon. So I'm looking for some lesson plan ideas, by the okay, way. Okay, great. Well, great. Um, you know, let's, let's try to understand, uh, you know, what this country experienced in the Capitol with the riots on January 6th by, um, you know, looking at our historical context. And so, you know, many people saw what happened that day as something that was unprecedented. Um, but if you look back, especially at the Reconstruction era, that's not true at all. Uh, so can you um, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, uh, I was watching those events on January 6th on TV, like many people were, and the commentators kept saying, you know, this is unprecedented, this is not who we are, this has never happened before. Uh, yeah, it's unprecedented when it comes to the Capitol itself, the building itself. We, we haven't had a mob uh, storm the Capitol before, but certainly in during and after Reconstruction, that is in the last third, let's say, of the 19th century, you had a good number of violent episodes by white supremacists trying to and sometimes succeeding in overturning democratically elected governments, biracial governments, because in Reconstruction, for the first time in American history, African-American men uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, significant political power. Uh, and this, of course, produced a, a pretty violent backlash among uh, most of the white South. Uh, so, yeah, you had events like the Colfax massacre in Louisiana, 1873, when, uh, again, armed an armed mob of whites uh, surrounded the, the county, or they called it the parish in Louisiana, uh, courthouse, and eventually killed a whole bunch of black militiamen who were defending the local government. You had the White League in New Orleans in 1874, uh, an uprising trying to overthrow the... Um, elected government of Louisiana. After Reconstruction, you can go to the Wilmington riot of 1898, where again, an elected biracial local government was just ousted by a kind of armed coup d'etat by a white mob. So in other words, we have seen this kind of thing before, uh, so unfortunately. Yeah, and can, can we get into uh, Reconstruction itself? It's a really fascinating period of our history. And, and obviously, like you just mentioned, there was great repression. Um, so could you talk about what was re uh, Reconstruction broadly, but also what were some of the progressive gains that were made yeah. during Reconstruction? Well, Reconstruction, uh, that term is used for two, not, uh, two slightly different things. One is it's a time period of American history. It's the usually the, the 12 years after the Civil War, 1865 to 1877, sort of like the Progressive Era, the New Deal, it's a period of American history. But more significantly, I think, Reconstruction is a very complicated historical process. It's the process by which the country tried to come to terms with the abolition of slavery in this country. You know, there were 4 million slaves in the United States in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. This was by far the largest slave system the modern world has ever known. And, uh, you know, the Civil War destroyed it. And, and that raised as many questions as it answered. And the number one question was, what's going to be the status of these four million emancipated slaves? Are they going to be citizens? Are they going to have the same rights as white people? What does it mean to be free anyway in America? Does it carry with it political rights, economic rights, social rights? That was the battle in Reconstruction. Reconstruction was a remarkable moment because uh, you had a, a remarkable coalition of uh, progressive-minded white people in the North and a, a very activist African-Americans in the South who sort of established the political agenda and uh, rewrote the laws and the Constitution, you know, three major amendments added to the Constitution, 13th, 14th, and 15th that established the right of citizenship of anybody born in the country and then introduced the idea of equality among citizens uh, in the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law for everybody. In fact, beyond citizens, all persons uh, 
entitled to equal protection of the law. That included immigrants and people who aliens, one kind or another. Um, so Reconstruction was the first real experience of biracial democracy in American history. Uh, and these governments in the South, they they had numerous problems. I mean, you know, you can list them all. There, were, there was the vast economic destruction that the Civil War had caused. There was this violent white supremacist uh, backlash where they, you know, large numbers of white people just refused to accept the idea of African-American people as uh, equal citizens of the country. Um, and, um, you know, they face a lot of challenges building from scratch a Republican Party, a biracial Republican Party in the South, uh, and dealing with the northern allies whose, whose interests often weren't quite the same as those of recently freed slaves. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a time which, uh, to, even though it failed in the sense that it didn't secure permanently the rights that were actually written into the laws and constitution, um, it is an inspiring moment. And I think there are a lot of lessons in Reconstruction uh, for the current uh, situation, both in terms of the politics of Reconstruction and the economic change or lack thereof uh, in that time period. Yeah, you know, one thing that I, I found interesting was um, just the power of Congress at the time and, and how far uh, Congress was willing to go to ensure that Southern Democrats would um, accept uh, this new reality in America, right? And so yeah. um, can you talk about that a little bit? Because it's something, I mean, when you think about how incredibly weak and pathetic our Congress is today and you compare it to what Congress did, did then, it kind of really like blows your mind. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a very good point, you know. All three of those pivotal constitutional amendments, 13, 14, 15, end with a clause saying Congress shall have the power to enforce this amendment. In other words, they said, look, we are the ones who are going to decide, is equal protection of the law being uh, guaranteed in the South? Uh, and many other issues, the privileges and immunities of citizens, due process of law, other things which are actually not weren't very much thought of until right now. I mean, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that uh, anybody who took an oath to support the Constitution and then supported or gave, you know, aid and comfort to insurrection uh, is going to be forever barred from holding office. Uh, many people today are thinking, uh, and I support this, this should be... Um, this should be imposed on ex-president Trump. I mean, this is the kind of thing that the Congress was trying to ward off the president or other officials actually sympathizing with, uh, you know, insurrection. Um, the Congress was in under the control of the Republican Party with a very large majority. The South was not yet represented in Congress when Reconstruction began. Um, and um, the president, uh, Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln after Lincoln's assassination, was a deeply racist uh, white Southern Southerner, white supremacist, probably the most racist president we've had, actually, although there's some competition for that title. Um, so um, you're absolutely right. Congress seized the initiative. Congress said, we're going to determine what is necessary to reunite the country, and we are going to enforce these constitutional amendments. And in the early 1870s, Congress passed what were called enforcement acts to bring federal power to bear in the South to try to crush the Klan and uh, white supremacist terrorist groups like that, and uh, to try to implement the rights that had been written into the Constitution, but weren't so easy to implement on the ground level. And uh, can you talk a little more about the conservative reaction to Reconstruction um, and especially, you know, the populist movement kind of showed some examples of poor white people uniting with poor black people. And, you know, if that was destroyed, then the whole hope of Reconstruction was. So how okay. did they get poor white people to, you know, join yeah. the reaction? What was the propaganda? And I mean, what can we learn from that today as we're dealing with the situation where many people are supporting the far right who it's not really in their interest to do so. Yeah, well, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois in his great book, Black Reconstruction in America, which was written in the 1930s, and one of the uh, 
early attempts to show the promise and the achievement of Reconstruction, because at that time, Reconstruction, most historians were just dismissing it as a period of misgovernment and corruption and everything, uh, which is not true at all. But, um, you know, Du Bois said that the real problem in Reconstruction was the failure of white workers to see a community of interest with poor black people in the South. In other words, white and black labor did not coalesce uh, in the way that Du Bois f- f- wanted it to have or felt it should have. And he used this phrase, which has become quite commonly used lately, the wages of whiteness. Poorer white people, um, it, it, a way you might translate that today is white privilege, you know, wages of whiteness. Factory workers in the North, poor white farmers in the South, not all, but most of them, it seems, did not see that the interests of emancipated slaves were fundamentally the same as their uh, interests. The heritage of racism was very hard to overcome. You're talking about four, five, six, seven years after the end of slavery, you know, uh, it's, it, it's hard to uh, imagine that people would just throw off the whole heritage of racism and say, oh, well, okay, now we're going to accept black people as our equal citizens. In fact, a good number did. I mean, it might be in in a number of states like North Carolina or Arkansas, some of the poorer whites who were not part of the plantation system, who lived in the more uh, upcountry, you know, mountainous areas, weren't really plugged into the plantation regime. Uh, in those areas, you did have a lot of white people for a good amount of time who joined up in uh, coalitions with uh, recently freed slaves. And that happened off and on until the end of the 19th century. In the 1890s, the populist movement, that's when, that's when the word populism is really ought to be used. Not today, it's thrown about uh, very uh, unanalytically, let's say. But uh, the populist movement in the South in the 1890s did try to bring black and white farmers together, small farmers, tenant farmers, sharecroppers, people like that. Um, It had some success, but again, the the power of white supremacy was uh, pretty strong. And you might almost say the legacy or the weight of the Civil War weighing on political alignments. You know, uh, Northerners were gonna vote Republican uh, for a long, long time, that was the party of the Union, of Lincoln, of, sla- of emancipation. White Southerners, most of them were tied to the Democratic Party, the party of the Confederacy, the party of uh, white supremacy. Um, so you can look at it and say, well, p- some, f- some progress was made in building interracial coalitions. You had black, you know, the legislatures of Southern states had black people and white people working together in the same you know, body, the first time ever in American history you had anything like that. And it was only around 1900 when the right to vote, which had been granted to black men during Reconstruction, was finally taken away by the southern states as part of the imposition of the Jim Crow system. Uh, It was only when black voting was basically eliminating that the possibility of black-white political alliances in the South was kind of killed until, you know, 70 years later with the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Revolution, when again, the possibility of these political uh, alliances was uh, revived. Can we talk a little bit about the the way that Reconstruction is is taught in this country and, and, and how the story has kind of been I mean, rewritten. Um, I, I, do you agree with that? And if so, uh, to whose benefit? Well, you know, Re- Reconstruction is a good example of how po- historical interpretation is part of the present as well as the past. What I mean is it reflects the present and it influences the present. So after Reconstruction, let's say in the late 19th, very late and early 20th century, the the Dunning, what we call the Dunning School, named after my predecessor a long time ago at Columbia, William A. Dunning, who was teaching there. He and his students put forward the first scholarly books on Reconstruction, but they were completely biased against blacks. Uh, They felt that giving black men the right to vote was the biggest mistake in American history. Black people are just inferior. They're incapable of um, 
you know, of taking part intelligently in a political democracy. And the result was corruption, misgovernment, that the Reconstruction governments were the lowest point in the history of the United States. And this was partly a justification of the Klan, you know, well, yeah, maybe they went a little overboard, but they were really, you know, they had good reason to try to get rid of these governments and to put black people back in their proper place of subordination. And that view of reconstruction as really a, a big mistake lasted a long, long time. That's and in the North as well as the South. I mean, I was, uh, I grew up in the in Long Island in the suburbs. That's what I learned in high school, you know, in my textbooks, my teacher, uh, that reconstruction was just a terrible error. It's not really taught that way anymore. Over the past generation or two, a whole bunch of historians, including me and a lot of others, have rewritten the history of Reconstruction and see it in a much more positive light, I see it as a kind of a precursor, you might say, to the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, which is sometimes called the Second Reconstruction. But the point I want to make is that the old view of Reconstruction was part of the intellectual le legitimation of the Jim Crow South. In other words, the rights of black people have been taken away by that point, but Reconstruction was the justification for that. If you gave black people the right to vote, if you gave them other civil rights, you'd have a replay of the so-called horrors of Reconstruction. Whenever anyone said, hey, look, you know, this is not a Fair, fair or equal system in the South, they say, all right, but look, we don't want to have another reconstruction here, so we got to keep black people in a subordinate uh, position. So a historical interpretation became part of the justification for a racist present. And it's a sad commentary, I have to say, as a historian, it's a commentary on the historical profession in this country and how it sacrificed, you know, historical scholarship, really, on the altar of racism. Du Bois made this point brilliantly in Black Reconstruction in his final chapter, where he, which is called the propaganda of history. And it was just taking apart the whole edifice of historical interpretation as it existed there in the 1930s. So the history of Reconstruction, how we think about Reconstruction matters. And, uh, but I think there's been a lot of progress in the way it's taught in the last, I, I look at American history textbooks, I think Reconstruction is presented in a much more positive light now than it used to be. And of course, um, D.W. Griffith's uh, Birth of a Nation is a great example of that rewriting of history. If anyone wants to be appalled and shocked, uh, go up and look up some clips of Birth of a Nation. Um, uh, it, it had its premiere in the White House under Woodrow Wilson, and it's a glorification of the Ku Klux Klan. And um, again, it's the same point. A, a lot of it is about Reconstruction and the so-called just collapse of genuine democratic government, and it, it justifies the Klan. So yeah, in other words, this view of Reconstruction was not just a scholarly issue within the historical profession. It became part of the broad general culture. And Birth of a Nation was in very important in pushing it uh, out in that way. Yeah. You know, I can't help but think of um, a quote that Mike Pompeo got a little bit of heat for, um, where he said that the winners get to write the history books. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, now the losers are writing them, at least the people right. who supported Reconstruction, uh, in a way. Um, yeah, well, I don't think we should take Pompeo as our guide for the writing of history. But actually, speaking of Pompeo, a, a little uh, straw in the wind here took place on the very night of January 6th. They, after the mob left and they went back to counting up the electoral votes, Lindsey Graham, of all people, you know, when, when there were these challenges to the legitimacy of the electoral votes, Lindsey Graham said, you know, uh, oh, oh, it was Ted Cruz that said, well, why don't we have an electoral commission to look into this, like they did at the end of Reconstruction, because Reconstruction was officially ended in a disputed election of 1876. And uh, Graham said, you know, I don't think that um, uh, that electoral commission then really worked out all that well, because they ended up ending Reconstruction. 
<laughs> and instead of Reconstruction, we got Jim Crow, which was terrible. So you had Lindsey Graham defending the history, the reputation of Reconstruction on the Senate floor in the middle of the night. Uh, and I said, well, well, times have changed, I guess. Uh, I, the, a guy like Lindsey Graham from South Carolina wouldn't have been defending yeah. Reconstruction not, not that long ago. Yeah. There's a great story about um, C.L.R. James, the great uh, black Marxist writer and activist. Um, he thought Birth of a Nation was such a great piece of cinema. He used to sneak in the theaters to watch it in the morning and then pick it in the afternoon. Um, it's, very, it's very dramatic. Uh, right. I mean, you know, well, it's like Malcolm X. Remember saying, uh, I used to go and sneak in and watch Tarzan movies. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> but I, he, did, he said, it took me a long time to realize that. I was not Tarzan. I was the guy Tarzan was trying to fight, you know? Uh, so, yeah, Birth of a Nation is considered a landmark in cinema because of its technical uh, advances, but it's deeply racist. And, you know, it had practical consequences. There were lynchings in the South mm -hmm. inspired by people watching the film Birth of a Nation, you know? Right. So it wasn't just a question of freedom of speech or something. There were very practical results of that kind of racist ideology. Yeah. Um, so one one question that comes up on the left, I think in increasingly more people on the left are talking about um, the federalist nature of our government and how that makes, um, you know, meaningful reform difficult. Can you talk about, I mean, what can we learn from Reconstruction about the federalist nature of our government and maybe how to overcome that? Right. Well, you know, <laughs> Reconstruction was a tremendous exercise of national power. As you, you said a little while ago, Congress kind of seized the levers of power and operated them for a, a, a good number of years. Um, and they had to do that. I mean, slavery had been created by state law. It wasn't the federal government. The federal government protected it, but it was state law that really established slavery. Um, President Andrew Johnson get, created new governments in the South controlled by white people, and they started using their local power to try to push people black into a condition almost of slavery, so-called black code laws, uh, forcing people to go to work or be put in jail, that kind of thing. Um, so it needed federal intervention. It needed national intervention, absolutely. And those constitutional amendments and the first national civil rights laws that were passed in Reconstruction uh, these things, uh, and then even, and vigorous action. I mean, in 1871, uh, President Grant sent the troops into South Carolina to crush the Ku Klux Klan, which he succeeded in doing for a while. Later on, that kind of violence recurred and Northerners had become less willing to intervene on behalf of former slaves in the South. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, <laughs> I personally, and I don't speak for anyone on this except myself, I think people on the left should not worry so much about federal power, state power. I think wherever you can, you push forward our principles. And there's nothing inherently good or bad about state power or national power. I mean, under Trump, he used the latent power of the presidency in all sorts of terrible ways. Uh, that's national power, but it was, was not used properly. You know, national power is very important when you get to a place like Reconstruction, but I'm, look, look what's happening. You know, what about when uh, the border patrol on the, Canadian, on the Mexican border is exemplifying national power? So, you know, it, to me, it's not a question of federalism versus state power, national power. It's what are the policies, what are they trying to accomplish and, um, you know, are they good or bad, basically? And I think at any level, people can struggle and should struggle to get, you know, better policies in this country. You know, on the left right now, there's this uh, debate regarding um, how to respond to the Democratic Party. Uh, should the left be oppositional to the Democratic Party? Um, and, you know, if not, what are what are some of the limitations of supporting Democrats at every turn, um, especially under this system where you don't really have yeah. any options? You know, I think you can learn something from Reconstruction. Um, mm -hmm. The in you know, you, as I said, the dynamic force was both African Americans themselves in the South claiming uh, 
rights they had never enjoyed, but also the group in Congress called the Radical Republicans. Um, people like Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, the senator. One of the more ironic, perhaps, photographs from January 6th was a guy with his Confederate flag standing in front of a portrait in the capital of Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist uh, mem member of the Senate from Massachusetts. But the radicals knew how to be radicals within the political system. And they, how they, op they were part of the Republican Party, but they also had their own distinct identity. They pushed for things, but they knew, in a sense, they knew how to use the political system to move forward. They put forward principled stands on everything, on black rights and other things, but they knew when to compromise. They knew you might have to take half a loaf instead of the whole thing at the moment. Um, they worked outside of Congress to promote, to generate public opinion in favor of their, uh, their policies. And uh, both in the Civil War and Reconstruction, they were you know, part of the cutting edge of politics. They weren't a majority. There was never a radical Republican majority in Congress. But in a crisis, people who have a clear program have a lot more power than just their numbers because your mainstream kind of middle of the roaders didn't know what to do about Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And they tried various things which didn't work out very well. And eventually they said, you know, these radicals, I'm not sure I like them all, but they've got a real plan. Maybe, maybe what they're trying to get accomplished here, black suffrage, you know, equal rights, all that, maybe that'll solve the problem of Reconstruction. So, um, you know, my view is you've got to be both in and out of the Democratic Party that's today or the Republican Party as it was back in the 1860s. Uh, don't just burn all your bridges. That wouldn't really, you don't want to isolate yourself, uh, which is always a danger. Uh, and you don't want to just succumb to the rule of the majority of your party because you're always going to be a minority. But taking the role of the ideological vanguard in a crisis moment uh, can lead to very substantial accomplishments. And I think Reconstruction shows that. And, uh, you know, there was a heavily working class component to Reconstruction and the Republican Party. Um, you know, today there's a lot of talk about it seems like many working class people are leaving the Democratic Party, either dropping out of politics or going to the Republicans. So I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, does it matter? And if it does, what, what do we do about that? No, I, think, I think it's unfortunate if uh, working class people or any people join up with the Republican Party. That's uh, definitely not the way our country ought to be going. Um, you know, there's a million pundits out there analyzing election returns and all that. It certainly does seem that a shift has been taking place whereby the Democrat, at least the the, the ways the Democrats win is by attracting a more upper class or not upper, but upper middle class electorate, um, uh, suburban people. Um, everyone is commenting on how in the last election, 2020, you know, a certain number of African-American voters and uh, Latino voters uh, moved actually toward Trump uh, and that the um, it was actually among white suburbanites that the shift from Trump to Biden took place. You know, I think that's very unfortunate. I think the Democratic Party at the moment is pushing forward policies that would be very uh, advantageous to large numbers of working class people. It's not socialism. It's not social democracy. Uh, all the flaws you can easily identify. And yet compared to what we have had, uh, I think it's many of these policies are a step forward um, and I think need to be supported by radicals as steps toward greater progress uh, in the in the future. Um, but, uh, you, you know, a, a, a part of the problem here is when people talk about working class voters, they tend to, they tend on, in an unspoken way to be talking about white people. 
you know, most black people, as you were mentioning in your previous segment about black capitalism, most African-Americans are working class people. Most Latino people are working class people. Uh, and yet they don't seem to count in the analysis. They are used, they're categorized by their race or their ethnicity, not their class position. So if you add them in, you'll find that there are still a heck of a lot of working class people who are supporting the Democratic Party. And um, one, ho you know, the, the Democrats have been over the past 20, 30 years are quite guilty of promoting policies, you know, financialization of the economy, globalization, which have been very disadvantageous to large numbers of Americans, including working class Americans. So, you know, people saying, well, I can't trust either of these parties. Uh, you know, they got a point, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the Democrats said, well, trust us, we're different now. It takes time for people to uh, accept that, I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have one final question, um, if you mm -hmm. allow the time, because I know you of have course, to go. go ahead. Um, but what you just said um, sparked another question that I had uh, regarding, you know, it, it is interesting that the Democratic Party, I think, makes a very intentional effort to, um, you know, uh, refer to um, the African-American community based on their race and, and not identify, uh, you know, their class. And so I think they do that mainly so they don't have to focus on economic issues um, during their campaigning. And instead, they focus on, um, you know, topics of intersectionality, topics of race, gender, sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so how do we tackle that? Um, on the left. So we have more of a material understanding of what's going on and, and, and make arguments that actually matter, that would actually uplift yeah. universalist programs, that would uplift everyone, but especially, <laughs> you know, the working class in this country, which, uh, as yeah. you mentioned, primarily consists of um, Black people, people of color. Um, how do we address it without, I think, the inevitable backlash that's perpetuated by mass media, you know, the backlash. Yeah, the yeah, you know, I've, <laughs> I'm laughing just because uh, this question has been debated, uh, I don't know, since the first uh, guys got off the May Mayflower boat, you know. Um, how do you balance off race and class in a society in which both are bases of inequality of all kinds, but they're not exactly the same thing, even though they overlap? in significant ways. Um, I mean, the fact is that I, I think what Democrats have to do is to promote things that will benefit everybody. It's, this doesn't mean you ignore the specific racial configuration of so many forms of inequality in our society, but things that are being talked about right now, um, you know, COVID benefits to every family up you know working class family or raising the minimum wage even though it might as we heard hurt some small business people um you know i i am i, I don't i don't actually like to use the term identity politics because i think it carries with a lot it carries nowadays a lot of weight that i don't want to necessarily adopt but i i do think democrats have been sort of bemused into assuming that demography is kind of political destiny, you know, and uh, that, you know, you remember all this talk, oh, you know, in 2045, we're going to have a majority minority country, white people will no longer be a majority, and therefore the Democrats are just going to rule forever. Well, we discovered in the last election, a lot of people who are not white aren't necessarily Democrats either, and that some of what Trump says appeals to people who are working class, but are not, you know, who are non-white, but none, the people of color. Um, and I think it's, it's important to get away from the idea that be, by virtue of being a person in color, you, of color, you are automatically kind of assumed to be a Democrat forever. And I think once we get away from that idea and realize we have to appeal to people all across the board, um, Maybe uh, now that doesn't mean dropping a, a, a critique of racist policing or things like that, but it does mean 
uh, not only talking about things that are specifically uh, affecting one group or another, but trying to talk about things that are good for everybody, or at least the large swath of the population. Professor well Eric Boner, thank you. Yeah, that that was. Thank you for answering that question. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you, um, you know, being so generous with your time today. My um, pleasure. My pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you, and um, let keep up the fight. Right. Thanks, thank Professor. you so much. Okay. Bye bye.